Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. In today's video, we will run through some common pathologies affecting the neck and the throat, as well as the relevant clinical anatomy. This is the second video of two covering this topic. We will cover pharyngeal pouches, obstructive sleep apnea, cancers and neck lumps. Let's start with pharyngeal pouches. Killian's dehiscence is a triangular shaped area of weakness in the muscular wall of the pharynx. It is located between the transverse bundle of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor, also known as thyropharyngeus, and the oblique bundle of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor, also known as cricopharyngeus. When there is poor coordination of the peristalsis of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscles, the intraluminal pressure increases and an outpouching can develop in this muscle deficient area, which is known as a pharyngeal pouch, or Zenker's diverticulum. This is quite a rare phenomenon, and occurs more in males than females, typically in older people. Patients may complain of dysphagia, regurgitation of food, chronic cough, hoarseness of voice, halitosis due to food decaying within the pouch, and recurrent chest infections. On examination, you'll notice that a patient has a lump in the neck which gurgles on palpation. You may also note the halitosis. A pharyngeal pouch can be diagnosed by barium swallow. According to NICE guidelines, the traditional treatment for a pharyngeal pouch is diverticulectomy, which is removal of the pouch, or myotomy of the cricopharyngeus muscle. Usually this is done by open surgery, but more recently, endoscopic techniques are being used instead to speed up recovery times and reduce the risk of complications. Obstructive sleep apnea refers to obstruction of the airway when muscles of the neck relax during sleep, resulting in the patient waking up several times to adjust their position and open the airway. Risk factors for obstructive sleep apnea syndrome include male sex, obesity, family history, craniofacial abnormalities such as Treacher-Collins syndrome and adenotonsillar hypertrophy. Patients will present with core symptoms, excessive daytime sleepiness and snoring and or impaired concentration. Plus, they may also have additional symptoms like mood swings, personality changes, feeling unrefreshed on waking and witnessed apneas while sleeping. In children, additional symptoms include unusual sleep posture, for example, the head bent backwards, nocturnal enuresis, failure to thrive and daytime mouth breathing. On examination, look for risk factors of obstructive sleep apnea. So look for nasal obstruction, examine the jaw, and look for enlarged tonsils in children. Calculate the BMI and measure the patient's neck circumference as well. Ask the patient to complete an Epworth sleepiness questionnaire to assess the extent of the problem and quantify how the symptoms are affecting the patient's day-to-day -day life. Investigations like thyroid function tests can help to find the underlying cause of the obstructive sleep apnea. An ECG and chest X-ray are also essential because heart failure and lung complications can develop as a result of OSA. In secondary care, a sleep study is performed to definitively diagnose the condition. Treatment is multifactorial. Refer to a sleep centre for confirmation of the diagnosis and for secondary care treatments, like CPAP. While waiting for an appointment in secondary care, conservative management options can be used. Encourage the patient to lose weight, exercise, reduce alcohol intake and stop smoking. They should also be advised to sleep on their side. Give the patient written and verbal information about OSA as well as information about support groups that provide self-management advice, like the Sleep Apnea Trust. Give advice on driving and entitlement to drive. The patient should not drive until assessed by a specialist. They must inform the DVLA if they have sufficient daytime sleepiness to impair driving. The DVLA will also need to be informed if in secondary care use of CPAP or an intraoral device is initiated. CPAP can help with symptomatic management. It forces the airways to stay open and prevents collapse of the airway and apnea. People will require lifelong treatment and have to wear either a nasal or face mask for airflow delivery at night. Poor adherence to CPAP is common, as it can cause epistaxis, 
throat and nose dryness, and soreness. Intraoral devices, such as a mandibular advancement device, are appropriate for people with mild OSA and normal daytime alertness. In children where enlarged tonsils are found on examination and are likely the cause of the OSA, adenotonsillectomy is indicated. Refer to a paediatric ENT specialist. Now let's talk about some cancers of the neck or throat. Throat and neck cancers are usually squamous cell carcinomas. Risk factors for developing SCCs of the neck or throat include heavy tobacco smoking, drinking excessive amounts of alcohol, poor dentition, gourd, lower socioeconomic background, and ethnicity. Nasopharyngeal cancers are more common in people of Chinese ethnicity, for example. Symptoms that should make you suspicious about an underlying cancer include unilateral nasal bleeding, unilateral nasal obstruction, bleeding from the mouth, dysphonia such as hoarseness with no known cause, dysphagia, rapid onset of symptoms, facial palsy, weakness or numbness, stridor, an unexplained neck mass, and rapid unintentional weight loss. Useful investigations include a staging CT neck and chest and examination, plus biopsy under anaesthetic. Bloods like baseline FBCs, Usenes, LFTs and TFTs must also be done. Neck and throat cancers can be managed like any other cancers, with radiotherapy, chemotherapy, surgery or palliative care. An MDT approach is essential to decide the full management plan on a case-by-case -case basis. Finally, we will talk about neck lumps. A neck lump can point to many diagnoses. The most common cause is reactive lymphadenopathy. It is usually benign, caused by infection or viral illness, but may also point to a more sinister cause, like malignancy. Therefore, a full history and examination is really important. Reactive lymphadenopathy usually arises suddenly, and the lump or lumps are mobile. It is self-resolving, usually within six weeks. Skin infections are another cause for neck lumps, such as abscesses or infected sebaceous cysts. These will typically be erythematous, fluctuant, well-defined lesions that are warm to touch. They'll be painful on palpation. There may be pus seen on examination or on gentle probing. Skin cancers such as BCCs, SCCs or malignant melanomas should be considered as well. The neck is a common site for skin cancers to occur as it's a sun-exposed area. Lipomas and other benign tumours are found on the neck and are a good differential to keep in mind. Lipomas are smooth, round and fluctuant. Silolithiasis refers to a stone in the salivary duct. It's another important differential to consider. Patients will present with pain which gets worse during meals and a swelling, usually in the territory of the submandibular gland. Ultrasound scans and silograms are useful investigations to request. Management is usually conservative, prescribe analgesia and encourage the patient to drink adequately. If severe, radiological or surgical removal of stones or the gland can be considered. A pulsatile mass found on the lateral neck is likely to be a carotid aneurysm. A patient with rubbery, raised lymph nodes with a history of night sweats, fever, weight loss and splenomegaly may point to a diagnosis of lymphoma. An urgent referral on the cancer pathway is essential. A neck mass that gurgles when palpated and is associated with halitosis, dysphagia, recurrent aspiration and a chronic cough points to a diagnosis of a pharyngeal pouch. A thyroid swelling will move upwards on swallowing. In suspected thyroid cancer, refer the patient via the cancer pathway to an ENT specialist. Take bloods for TFTs to help guide management in secondary care. ENT specialists may request further investigations, like ultrasound of the neck, fine needle aspiration of the swelling, or even a diagnostic hemithyroidectomy for histology. If the thyroid swelling is non-neoplastic, conservative management or simple surgical removal may be indicated. If the swelling is found to be thyroid cancer, then total thyroidectomy plus post-adjuvant radioiodine therapy is the mainstay of treatment. If the disease is anaplastic disease, then palliation may be necessary. 
thyroidectomy is a relatively common procedure and complications include post-op hemorrhage, airway obstruction, vocal cord palsy and hypocalcemia due to removal of the parathyroid glands. If the patient is younger, a few other diagnoses should be included in your differentials for a neck lump. A thyroglossal cyst, for example, is a neck lump that is commonly found in the midline between the thyroid and the hyoid bone. It moves upwards when the patient protrudes their tongue. A cystic hygroma is a lymphangioma found on the neck present from birth usually, typically on the left lateral neck. A branchial cyst is a mobile, fluctuant, oval-shaped mass between the SCM muscle and the pharynx. Thanks for watching.